surging. Um, this whole epidemic has kind of put a small halter on that, but I'm sure it'll come back once everything's all right. Um, what kind of advice would you give to new indie developers that one are looking to move to the arcade scene, but also that have to build that community around it to actually get it into bars? Um, number one is play test. It's, it's not great advice during this pandemic because it's diff- more difficult than ever to play test, but you got to play test your game and you got to play test it with arcade people because they're the ones that are going to stand up to your game. Um, and, and I was really fortunate that I got to use the killer queen scene to play test my games because they're all very avid, very functional arcade players. Um, another thing I never really intended to happen is after that, that GDC event, I was just going to go build the cab and take it there and then figure everything out from there. But I got a call like two weeks later asking if I could bring it to a killer queen tournament just some kind of setup because people were really enjoyed it at the other one. And, and then I got another call from another killer queen. And then that's really when the game started to evolve into what it is now. I, I mean, it in the beginning it would, I have some of the old builds and it was just such a simple like game of lift and bubble at the time. And now it's got, you know, all the slides and all the maps and all the effects and, and all these things and the polish and, uh, it's really in that period that it developed very strict mechanical sense based on all this feedback I was getting from very avid arcade fans. Where was the um, the inspiration of the art? I mean, I know you did all that yourself. Is there any yeah. like game in particular that you really liked the style or? Yeah, that's a great uh, question. So mechanically, the game is very inspired by Rocket League and Killer Queen, as I was just saying before. But art-wise, and in game design-wise too, it uh, got its inspiration from this really awesome game called Downwell. Um, Downwell is a rogue, a rogue-like falling arcade game. And the whole idea is you just start, you're just standing on the earth and there's a well and once you jump down into the well you just start falling and like there's ledges and stuff you can land on but the 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 interesting thing about the game is you're wearing gun boots so every time you shoot you shoot bullets downwards and it slows your fall so the whole game the whole game it's and it's all this two color uh game design so it's like black and white or like uh you can mix the match the color schemes but uh black and white is the classic one and the big game design stuff I really drew from that is everything in Downwell is intended to serve two purposes. Everything like, like shooting not only hurts enemies below you, but it slows your trajectory. And I really, I really think that that creates really complex, interesting choices in games. And so when you think about, well, Jumping is not only how I raise my elevation in Death Ball, but it's also how I place another bubble. Like those things pairing together, movement and placement of your set piece, they create this challenging interplay of when is it? When do I go for the bubble, or when do I sacrifice my old bubble to get higher on the map? Um, those kind of trade offs they're born out of forcing things to have two, two. Uh, mechanical objectives right i totally see that i mean that's that's the idea with um having kind of a skill ceiling uh where it's just the more you play the better you get and you can really notice that with people that have been playing for a long time i mean a game Mm -hmm. that i think of obviously other than killer queen um, shout out to another indie game is going to be uh switch and shoot where Mm -hmm. every time you push the button you either move left or right but you also fire at the same time so you Mm -hmm. you really have to build that skill um I thought that was a really, really cool mechanic. Um, one thing that... It's a true one-butt. What was that? It's a true one-butt. Yeah, yeah. It's all you do. It's one button, but it yeah. controls the entire game, and it's incredibly difficult. Like, yeah. I am not at all good at it. But it's and, a ton of fun. And Death Ball is, meets the arcade genre one-butt classification, which just means that you are a joystick and one button. Um, but, yeah, Switch and Shoot is... No joystick, even just legitimately one button, and it's crazy because you must think how boring and how quickly that should get boring 
to press one button. It doesn't. Uh, but it just doesn't because it it functions as these two things. And the game design also uh, in that game goes on to implement that, you know, things have multi-features there, like getting a, getting a power-up in that game gives you more bullets, but progresses you closer to the finish of the right. map. So, like, I just think that game also it has a lot of really great design in it. Oh yeah, and the boss battle and like the yeah. little tentacles and stuff and the the power up mechanic, it's all in all just a great game and never gets old for some reason. Yeah, thinking about all these other indie games, it's kind of got me on the track of uh conventions. Now, we've missed a lot of conventions this year, which is really unfortunate. I miss seeing all the people that are out at conventions. But what are some of the most memorable conventions that you've been to and who have you met there? Man, okay, so I think number one most memorable uh, conference has to be the first GDC that I went to, or sorry, the first Midwest Gaming Classic that I went to. It's where I met that's, you guys. That's what I was thinking too. Yeah. Uh, it's where I met the Cosmotrons dudes. Uh, and it was just switch like, and, shoot. and Switch and Shoot, yeah. Yeah, you're right. He was there too, uh, Dan. And it's just like, I remember we were so inspired by this idea that together we were all trying to like make this new arcade thing that was, to be fair, the Killer Queen guys really came and, and they blazed the trail for... Yeah, they kicked the door down for all of us. People. And they really like opened up a trail for us, but like it felt cool to be walking this trail with you guys and finding out that other people are trying to do this too and... Uh, I would say then the next, my next favorite one was probably uh, the latest Bumble Bash in Chattanooga. I don't Amazing. know. I just had such a tremendously fun amount of time at that. So time. much fun. Chattanooga is amazing. The event space was very cool. There were so many Killer Queen cabinets everywhere, and everybody was just so tremendously nice and open and accepting and welcoming. And and I got to meet the armed and gelatinous guys who turned out to be really cool guys too. So, you know, right. just we just talked to them last week. Yeah. Shout out to Rob and spooky. Yep. Yeah. So, yeah. So, uh, those are probably my two favorites. Uh, I didn't, I didn't mind last year's Midwest gaming classic either. That was a lot of fun. Uh, I got to meet, uh, Brian and Chris there who are, so, uh, Chris runs a bunch of arcades in, uh, the, Basically, out on the East Coast. Yeah, he's on the East Coast, like tri-state area, East Coast, uh, Pennsylvania, I think, and, and around there. Uh, yeah, West Virginia. And then he has a tech that he brought named Brian, and Brian's a really cool guy too. And just honestly, like there is, I sell cabs at these things, but that almost rarely fa filters into whether it's a good con for me or not. I, it, it generally comes down to the networking. And so I think the ones that I've been able to network and make the longest relationships that are more pertinent to what I'm trying to do, those have stuck with me the most. Okay. Um, so for people on there, how can we get a hold of you? Like, what's your Instagram handle? Like, where can we find you? Instagram, I think everything is Death Ball Arcade. So Instagram, Twitter, Facebook. Uh, YouTube is not. I think YouTube's still under my personal account. But yeah, it's still under your name. There's very little up on YouTube. I haven't really done any real big YouTube push. Um, but if you want to find the website, if you want to order, it's deathball.cab, deathball.cab. Uh, and if you want to email me, you can reach out at tony at deathball.cab. All right. Yeah, um, awesome. So I have a question. Uh, what is the, I, I, if you could list top five games you've ever played? Down to the mechanics. I know this is a hard question, but. Anything. This is broad. Anything. Anything. I, I mean, I, I honestly, well. It's tough a tough question. Take your time. It's a tough question because there are many factors here. And you kind of, you said, one, you know, you, you describe things that as a game designer, good games as like a nostalgia thing, like just games that like really shaped me, you know, like th that's yeah. five games. Let's, let's go that route. Let's go the nostalgia route. Okay. What games kind of inspired you as a gamer? 
uh, Goldeneye was okay. a huge oh, part. 64. Yep. Uh, 64. So I think my favorite platform was probably SNES, but 64 is where like I really started to play a lot of video games, I think. Uh, I, I, I mean, I think that... Oh man, it's when 3D came in, like Star Fox and like Mario. The, Star Fox 64 was it a uh, Super, Super Mario? Mm-hmm. No, it wasn't Super. It was Mario, Mario 64. Before Mario 64 is just it is one of those that is truly impactful to me as a person, uh, but also as a game designer. And there's a really great video about this, and it kind of alludes to what I was saying, like the multi-purpose thing from before. Uh, it's, it's about Mario's jump and it's by this game design YouTube maker called Mark Brown. And he makes this point in it that I think that has stuck with me so much. And it's, if you take Mario in Mario world and you use the joystick, the Z button and the A button. So four inputs on the joystick and two inputs on those two buttons. So a total of six inputs, there's like 22 different jumps you can make based on context and button combination. There is the single jump, the double jump, the triple jump, the backflip, the long jump, the ground pound, the side jump, the, uh, I, I, I don't even know if I, I, I don't even know if I, the running jump, the, there's like all these, right. the, the slide jump, all these different. There's so many functionalities for yeah. one motion. Yeah, and, and so all that talks about is uh, verb composition and how that's more interesting than like dictative controls. And what I mean by that is I like that Mario, what I'm trying to do is compose this very, this set of moves in a way that's really fun and interesting. Uh, and that's where the combos come from, as opposed to like a fighting game where the the moves are like recipes and they come by just like, putting the recipes next to each other. And there's absolutely composition there. That's important. But it's just like, because the moves are so, these like little defined combos of button presses themselves. They're so situational too. Yeah. It's really my main thing with Death Ball is I want it to be more like Super Mario in where you're composing moves based on a set of small movesets. So in Death Ball, there is, the lift, the slide jump, and the bubble, and the hard bubble. And you essentially can com- compose them in any ways that you want because they compose really well together. Um, and like some people have like this thing they'll do where they'll slide under the ball and then they'll down bubble to kick the ball backwards. And that's like not a move I ever intended to make. It's just I made these mechanics that are really fun and simple to use and re- give you a clear sense of how – they work in the world and then people can compose these combos that are really impressive. So it sounds like we're looking at golden eye and Mario 64. What are your other three? Star Fox 64. Okay. I probably should move away from 64 now. Just <laughs> give us some, it was know, such a good console what? though. It had such uh, a good game. Yeah. I'm actually, yeah, actually I got to, I got to throw Ocarina and time of time. In yeah. Yeah. Can't forget about a Zelda game. Yeah, I mean all the Zelda games. I can't. That's hard for me to even pick them. They're so. They're just like they never let me down. Even two, which lets a lot of people down. I still had fun playing. <laughs> I don't think it lets people down either. I think it's just more a different. It's like a different genre of game, really. <laughs> yeah. But, uh, okay, I think we're up to like four now. That's I gotta four. Come, yeah. I got to come up with at least one more. I'm, you know what? I'm gonna. I'm. I'm trying to. I'm hesitating to name any novel or, or modern games, but Rocket League is important to me. I think like mechanically, it's really sound. I played it for probably like three years, like at least two or three times a week, uh, and I just I never got sick of it. In fact, I had to stop playing simply because I couldn't level up anymore. I was just like plat, extremely plateaued, and I just. That's it. Only got less fun because the competition made me not like have fun with it. I can still pick it up and, and love just messing around with it. So you kind of yeah. just hit your ceiling, and that's that's what you're getting at. What's that? 
So you kind of hit your ceiling with your skill cap. Yeah. On it. Well, it's, I mean, without, without putting a lot more time and effort into it. Yes. But it is also that mixed with like something that has become fundamentally important to me. It's that online play can be extremely toxic. Yeah. Oh, totally. And the way that I've kind of run the whole thing is the way that I've kind of thought about death ball is when people are together, when they're face to face, it's really hard for people to be toxic to each other. Right. There's way more sportsmanship. It can certainly happen. People get heated. They can get into fights. But (laughs) the things that I've been called on Rocket League by somebody on my team for being so bold as to try to do something hard and messing up, like nobody would ever say that to my face. Right. Um, Yeah. And and it's just – it's it's – kind of just became really isolating to sit there and play over and over again and have teammates turn on you, not because you're bad. I don't even think I was playing bad. I just made a mistake and they're tilted. You know, they're, they've lost three games in a row. And then my mistake was just the point of which they were unable to hold back their toxicity anymore. And it's just, I kind of got over that whole experience. Well, that's what we're trying to do with bringing all these arcade games back is we want that face-to-face interaction and actually building a relationship with the people you're playing against. It's it's hard to have that toxic environment when you're right there with the people, and that's that's what I love about conventions. Yeah, I mean, I, I just, like, I have the same problem whenever I'm playing games, too. Like, the most toxic games to play are FPSs. You just you get the keyboard warriors talking crap, a 12-year-old that womps you just doesn't feel good. Whereas in like going to an arcade, you can just have fun and don't care if you win or lose, but still have that competitiveness. Yeah. Completely different atmosphere. Well, I'm going to wrap this one up here. Uh, Tony, can you give them those social medias again really quick? Yep. We're on facebook.com slash death ball arcade, Instagram.com slash death ball arcade, twitter.com slash death ball arcade. You can find us our website for ordering deathball.cab, deathball.cab. And you can uh, personally email me. I'm always happy to chat with people. Uh, Tony at deathball.cab. Awesome. Thanks for coming on, Tony. Yeah. Um, And this will be up pretty soon here, so you guys can check it out. Go check out his social medias. uh, Follow us on Indie Arcade, and we will see you next week. Yeah. Take care, y'all. See ya. Take care. Take care. Take care. Okay.